Welcome to another episode of TikTokers Who Did Terrible Things. For those of you who are new here, this is a series in which we delve into some of the most horrible atrocities ever committed by individuals associated with that platform. Now with that in mind, we hear it time and time again, how things on social media just aren't always as they seem to be. And as discussed in several of our prior episodes, we find this to be true more often than not. Well, one thing's for certain. Evil comes in many different forms. It doesn't discriminate. It doesn't come from any one single race, religion, or even a system of beliefs. It's always out there just lingering, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike. In this episode, we will be discussing three separate instances in which creators, for one reason or another, stepped well beyond the lines of morality, whether it be taking advantage of individuals in certain situations or even ending the life of another human being. Let's talk about some TikTokers who did terrible things, episode 16. Paul Breach, and look, this one's a little out of the ordinary. Reason being, we're about to delve in between the fine lines between reality and morality. Moreover, this is the first time someone's creator class type, specialty, and claim to fame are all one and the same. That is, some of the cringiest content you will ever come across. Now before you dive into the comment section saying, hey Slammerai, you're kind of just being mean here and making fun of the guy. No, quite literally, if you Google what Paul Breach is famous for, this is what pops up. Okay, this literally states Paul Breach himself is famous for making cringy content. But I will say this, technically the guy's original claim to fame was creating a song that had absolutely blown up over in the UK, one of which is copywritten so we unfortunately cannot play it for you here. But rest assured it is out there and it is also one of the first things that pops up when googling Paul Breach. At any rate, over the past few years, people in the UK have taken a rather fond disliking to this guy. Well, in the past few months, this sort of mutual feeling has began to spread over into the United States as well as many other countries around the globe. Essentially, there's been several points during Paul's career he's sort of been labeled an LOL cow, and for those of you who don't know what this means, think about it like this. It's kind of like one of those situations where someone thinks everyone is laughing with them but is actually laughing at them. And here's where things begin to get sort of sticky, so in order to understand the gravity of how things came to be, we need to start from the very bottom and work our way up to the more recent events, so I'm gonna go ahead and warn you. This may get kind of weird for a minute here, so just bear with me. You see, many individuals have a problem with the fact he befriends minors on that platform and has been caught DMing them on several different occasions, but more so, and I'm not even kidding you, the fact that at one point on Instagram he had liked a photo of an underage girl in a bikini was what made people mad the most. Now while some would state this is a bit of a stretch, quite simply liking a picture on Instagram, others would see it quite differently, stating that at no point should a 37 plus year old man ever be messaging, viewing, or liking posts of anyone that is underage. Well, eventually, Paul received so much heat that he was pretty much forced to address it, stating, Look, the only reason I had liked that photo is because the caption said the young girl had just beaten cancer. And I'm not going to give Paul much, but I will give him this. The post in question drove quite a bit of engagement, receiving hundreds of comments upon thousands and thousands of likes, many of which came from individuals that were way older than the OP. However, when looking into the list of reasons as to why so many people have a problem with him, this is one of the major ones that comes up. But this isn't where the story ends. There's much more that just all leads up to a certain point where people had finally had enough. You see, Paul used to work in a nursing home caring for the elderly and quite a few people in extremely grim situations in their final days. Well, it was during his time there, he developed a habit of kissing patients upon greeting them and saying goodbye. Now wait, keep in mind, we are not talking about like grabbing them by the back of the head, pulling them in close and shoving his tongue down their throat. No, we are talking about what many Americans used to refer to as a European or French hello. That is a quick no lip contact peck on either side of the cheek. At any rate, one of the patient's families ended up finding out about this, thus becoming very angry over the issue. So much so, it bled over onto his social media, and once again, here Paul was with an apology video explaining the situation. 
stating that over time, a general bond had began to form between him and a few of his patients, to the point where they had actually began pulling him in and kissing him on the cheek. Well, as stated by Paul himself, due to the fact he did not want to be disrespectful, he would return the favor. However, it really didn't seem to matter how Paul had spun it. The family was absolutely furious to the point where it actually ended up costing him his job. It was at this point the TikToker allegedly moved back in with his stepdad and started popping up on lives more and more frequently. Paul would go on to stand there and dance for hours, all the while making these seductive faces towards the camera. But what's crazy is it actually worked. People from all over the world began gifting him out the wazoo. I mean, there was a night the guy made over $6,000 in a single stream simply just dancing and shouting out his gifters. Well, since then, he has made several apology-style videos for various things he said or situations he's gotten himself into, but in my mind, it's the following three stories that tell you everything you need to know about Paul as a person. You see, Paul had been having sort of a romantic whirlwind with a woman he had met just a couple of months prior. Now, things would move along fairly quickly. As a matter of fact, Paul would move in within just a couple of weeks of actually beginning to date. Well, it was at this point, their relationship started to fall apart at an extremely fast rate. For lack of better words, she really didn't like the fact that the TikToker had just been sort of sitting around all day lounging out on her couch, not cleaning up after himself, and she'd actually end up breaking up with him literally Literally over a cup of yogurt being spilt on her couch. Well, upon being told to move out, Paul became so manic that in a desperate attempt to escape all the heartache, he ran out into a nearby field, becoming completely disoriented in the process, to the point where a search and rescue chopper actually had to be called in to locate and rescue him. Now, in all seriousness, we as human beings often find ourselves divided on certain topics while may be legal, others may strongly feel they are unethical. That is, Paul, at the age of 28, began dating a 16-year-old. And while yes, this was in the confines of the law in the UK, society would more so have a problem with the fact they had a baby before she was even 18. And I'm not going to lie to you, this one has a lot of people heavily divided on whether or not this is actually a terrible thing. While yes, in many areas of the world, the age of consent is 16, usually people under the age of 17 are legally treated as minors. Moreover, a lot of people out there state this type of behavior is downright predatory. With that, how do you personally feel about this issue? Should the laws be changed? Is this type of behavior predatory? I mean, I'll just say this. If my daughter was 16 and I found out a 28-year-old had been asking her out, I'd have a serious problem with it. For me, it's just like, why is a 28-year-old hanging out with people that are that much younger than himself? Something about that just doesn't really sit right with me. Without any further ado, let's hop right into episode 17, Esther Brubaker, otherwise known as Posh Mama on TikTok. Creator class type, holistic healer. Specialty, selling you products, claim to fame, the following incident. Well, during Posh Mama's time over on TikTok, she has accumulated roughly 1.1 million followers in the process. Now, this is mainly due to the fact a lot of her posts contain these very wholesome and positive messages. And although she spends a lot of her time educating people with holistic options for certain conditions, there was an incident back in 2013 in which she would take somebody's life, leaving two children to grow up without their father. So back in 2013, Esther had been dating a man by the name of Jeremy Anderson. And one day in April of that same year, the couple hired a babysitter in order to run some early afternoon errands. Well, upon heading back home, this extremely heated argument just erupts within the vehicle. And when they finally get back, they would sit there for a few minutes arguing before Jeremy gets out of the car. It was at this point, Esther slams the pedal to the metal, careening straight through Jeremy, killing him in the process. Now, as they had entered the driveway, the babysitter had sort of taken note of this and began collecting all of her belongings. So she grabs her bag and starts heading for the front door. But minute after minute would go by when they had never came back inside. She would then head out and discover Jeremy deceased laying there on the pavement. And Posh Mama was nowhere to be found. The babysitter then ran back inside in order to call emergency services. And when the police finally arrive, they discover extremely noticeable tire marks all over Jeremy. It was at this point they began repeatedly calling Esther on her cell phone until she finally answered. Well, that first call went a little something like this. <clears throat> hey, Esther, listen, there's some things we kind of need to talk to you about. We need you to come down to the station. To which she responded, no, I'm in another state, and then hung up the phone. 
Well, they would continue calling her over the course of the next few hours until she answers one final time asking a single question. Is he dead? Not too long after this, they discover Esther has driven off to a local bar in order to drink the night away with her ex-boyfriend. Now, before we go any further, it is very important to note, this ex-boyfriend of hers had no idea that she had just taken Jeremy's life. As far as he was concerned, she told him their relationship had just ended. Moreover, he still remains in contact with a lot of Jeremy's family to this very day. Now, in the beginning of Posh Mama's trial, it really seemed like they were going to charge her with murder for the crime. But alas, she would later accept a plea deal serving two and a half years for the charge of manslaughter. Well, in the more recent months, this sort of extremely delayed news of the crime began spreading like wildfire throughout the platform, with a TikToker by the name of Shiloh was here being the first person to truly talk about it and bring it to light. Well, not too long after that, Jeremy's daughter Genevieve, who was there on that fateful night, finds out just how large Posh Mama's platform has become. And well, upon scrolling through a few of her videos, she stumbles across a comment made by Esther stating the following. His daughter Genevieve is the absolute worst. She continues to defend him, even though he sexually assaulted her when she was a child, to which Genevieve would respond. He's doing everything possible to make me look bad, to make my dad look bad. In case you didn't remember, my dad is not alive to defend himself against these accusations. And because why? Oh, because Esther, posh mama, unalived him on purpose and she only got two and a half years for it. Since then, Genevieve along with her own mother and TikToker Shiloh was here have all been hit with seasoned assists, meaning they are no longer allowed to post any more content involving Posh Mama whatsoever. In addition to this, Shiloh was here is currently being sued for defamation due to the fact she claimed Esther had false teeth. Now it's worth noting, this was directly after Posh Mama lost her contract with New Ruganda meaning the company would no longer allow her to use their name or sell any of her products. On that note, another TikToker by the name of Jolly Good Ginger, along with myself, both had somewhat viral videos about this matter on that platform. And I just think it's weird she's choosing to silence all of these smaller creators who were actually affected by her actions. But as for Shiloh was here, while well, yes, I do feel for the woman having to hire a lawyer and take on all these great costs of battling her legally, this is the very definition of making sure your facts are right. And this is just one of the many major reasons we as creators have to reject a lot of these requests people send to us asking us to help them out. With that, how do you personally feel about this case? Many people state Esther has quite simply done her time and that it's in the past while she's just doing what she can to get by. While at the same time, many people on that platform are currently trying to get her canceled. Let's hop right into episode 18. Russ McCamey, otherwise known as Official McCamey Manor on TikTok. Creator class type, all things horror. Specialty, take the tour. Claim to fame, the McCamey Manor. Well, the now 60 plus year old veteran of the United States Navy has considered himself to be a part of the haunted house community for the past 30 years. And in the beginning, it was just that, a haunted house that operated one day a year on Halloween. However, as the years passed by, Russ would gradually begin ramping things up, hiring more actors, building more menacing attractions to the point where people were actually coming from all over the country just to experience his top tier level of haunted house. More importantly, things had become so extreme, customers would now have to sign a short one page waiver, pretty much stating that if they slipped, tripped or fell, suffering injury as a result, they would not press charges on the business or Russ himself. Now, while he had in fact created some something unique, something so different that truly enthralled the masses for businesses in that particular industry, absolutely no one could have foreseen his endgame or what it is he had actually been working towards. So in or around 2008, the then so-called chamber had become a place that was open year round. Moreover, the chamber had now become a place 100% dedicated to this sort of legal form of kidnapping and torture. And in the beginning, once you sign that waiver, there was no safe word, no getting out, no stopping the madness. Things had became so extreme, many of Russ's employees began quitting on the spot because they quite simply couldn't go through with the things he had been wanting them to do. People would spend hours being shifted from room to room, being force-fed their own hair, slapped, kicked, 
punched, humiliated, dunked in water, forced to eat bugs, having live scorpions placed into their mouths, and an assortment of really disgusting fluids smeared all over their faces. I mean, the list just keeps going on and on. Now eventually, word would begin to spread like wildfire throughout the state of California, to the point where Russ himself would be slapped with a season assist. Now this in turn would force him to relocate the business all the way over to Tennessee. However, the interesting thing about the state of Tennessee is that consent may be removed at any time. It was for this reason Russ would finally be forced to implement a safe word into this so-called tour. Moreover, while contestants would not physically have to pay him for these tours, they would in fact have to place a $100 deposit, as well as purchase a 40-pound bag of dog food and bring it to Russ. In addition to this, that waiver would be extended to a whopping 40 pages long, containing stipulations such as being tossed into a pit full of crocodiles and or alligators, having to navigate a 75-foot maze all the while completely submerged in water, having psychedelics injected into your system in order to hypnotize you. And I think at this point it goes without saying, it is in my core belief that most of the things listed in this waiver are quite simply put there in order to serve as scare tactics. In other words, there is no way in absolute hell that any of the aforementioned stipulations have any legal merit whatsoever. Now for those who are able to make it through the full 10 hours behind so-called closed doors with this guy, they would then be allowed to take a tour of an actual haunted house, which allegedly sits on that same property. However, it's worth pointing out, not a single person has ever made it to the very end bringing us to a contestant often referred to as Marine Russ, one of the biggest controversies to ever come out of this place. You see, this dude had made it down to the absolute wire. Roughly 20 minutes was left on the clock as the sun began to rise on the hills of his Tennessee location, when McCamey himself pulls the plug due to safety reasons. He would go on to state this contestant was experiencing hypothermia, but it's important to note, Marine Russ, that contestant, had been completely coherent throughout the entire duration of this period. He was answering questions at the drop of a dime, and hadn't even began to shiver yet. Well, his tour would end with a very heated verbal altercation between McCamey and himself, as he hands over the dog food and rides off into the sunrise. Now, many individuals out there firmly believe Marine Russ had been completely cheated. But I will say this, there is a crucial piece of misinformation that people often get wrong when talking about this specific incident. That is, while McCamey would later implement a $20,000 prize for anyone able to make it past the 10-hour mark, this prize was non-existent at that time. But again, it's worth noting, not a single individual has ever made it past the 10-hour mark. Thus, no one has ever actually claimed this prize. You see, McCamey does this thing where if he thinks a contestant is actually capable of making it through, he will very quickly continue to dial it up to the point where you will be leaving with multiple injuries covered in all kinds of filth you really wouldn't want to be around. Now at this point, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, well, these individuals know what they've gotten themselves into. They had the time to read the waiver, and they literally signed up to do it. And while yes, you are 100% correct, Russ's employees would eventually come out of the woodworks in a series of interviews stating the following. I was actually an actor. I've known Russ for yeah. a couple years. Um, and I used to be an actor, but it, it kind of, the manners changed. Can I please be interviewed? Sure. Sell them out. Are you interrupting? Sell them out. Um, I used to do it for the love of the haunt, for the love of scaring people, and it just got a little out of control. Um, I think Russ that's is not, kind of unstable. That's not true. No, that that is is. I think yeah. Russ is yeah. unstable, yeah. Okay. and I don't feel comfortable being alone with him anymore. Blackmail us. I think he's he's Bullshit. sadistic and he's. Sick. Off his knocker, yeah, he's crazy. Yeah, and you keep us here and you blackmail us, so. And this is where people began to realize Russ had been hiring some rather violent ex-cons pertaining to things like attempted murder, murder, and SA charges. Well, allegedly, he had been blackmailing them through threat of exposing them on his platform, which as it stands right now, he may have about 100,000 followers between every single one of his forms of social media. Well, since then, every single one of those employees has left his property, refusing to work for him ever again. And allegedly, Russ claims it is now but a one-man show between the contestant himself with the help of a couple of cameramen who 
aren't supposed to be getting involved. And lastly, look, for those of you out there who think you truly have a shot at winning that money, remember, not a single soul has ever made it through. He quite literally will not allow it to happen. He'll either end up pulling you for safety reasons or he will seriously maim you in the process. So that's it, y'all. That is going to do it for this episode of TikTokers Who Did Terrible Things. On that note, I sincerely hope you have an amazing whatever it is, wherever you may be. Peace out.